ado, hello everyone. This is a Platypus Affiliated Society panel on police brutality in the left. My name's Gabby. I'll be mediating the panel amongst our four speakers as they make opening remarks, respond to each other, and then some Q&A with the audience. So if you think of a question, make sure to ask the pan panelists by using the Q&A box. Before we get started, I'm going to introduce a little bit about Platypus Affiliated Society, introduce the panelists, and then I'll open the panel up with some remarks on the topic at hand to get them warmed up. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s and 30s, new 1960s and 70s, and post-political 1980s and 90s left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. We have a site that is called platypus1917.org. We have regular reading groups wherever you are. Now with Zoom, it's much easier to keep in contact. Um, so look up your local chapter. We have a podcast called Shit Platypus Says, and it's on Apple and SoundCloud. And every month we have the Platypus Review. So if you want to go on our website and you're interested in writing on the left, please let us know. And with that, I'll introduce our panelists. We have Chris Slos. He's a member of the Richmond branch of the Democratic Socialists of America. I don't have much more about his bio, but as we get into the conversation, I'm sure that he's going to have more to share about his experiences. We have Mike Golosh. He's a member of the Washington, D.C. branch of the Progressive Labor Party. Golosh attended Columbia University in the late 1960s, where he experienced the new left firsthand. Golosh worked for over 30 years as a driver for the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority, where he was a union organizer of the Metro. Then we have Chaz Buffet. He is an American anarchist based in Tucson, Arizona. Buffet founded C Sharp Press in 1984 to publish radical literature on anarchism, atheism, and music. Buffet also authored the influential essay, Listen Anarchist, in 1987 and has authored, edited, or translated over a dozen works since then. He's just put out his 50th book and, or a 50th book, and continues to author uh, pending words on political problems. John Palmucci Jr. is a member of the New Jersey branch of the Socialist Party USA. He's also an executive ed editor of that party's online publication, The Socialist. Um, I'd love to hear also whether he's still campaigning for Howie Hawkins and any kind of presidential electoral activity. We'll see what he has to say. Uh, but I will start our panel now with the description of uh, the recent events that have made this a more pressing topic. In the wake of the killing of George Floyd by the police against the, the backdrop of the COVID shutdown, protests have erupted in every state across America raising the issue of police brutality. The relationship of the left to these protests, however, has been unclear. Following disappointment with the Bernie Sanders campaign and the nomination of Joe Biden, the left has sought to politicize the protests and police brutality in different ways. How can the left address police brutality today? How has it sought to do so in the past? What is the role of the left in the current moment? And with that, I'm going to pass this off to Chris first and all of the panelists are going to have about eight to 10 minutes to give their remarks. Uh, I might interrupt and just have you finish up your thoughts so we can keep it moving. So Chris, uh, take it away. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction and first panel of this type I've ever really spoken on. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here to the organizers hosting and those speaking and those in the audience. Uh, it's really an honor to be speaking at such an event. Uh, this is a topic that I've actually, I believe touches everyday life. Um, I have, I <clears throat> witnessed a pretty, um, pretty awful case of police brutality firsthand. Uh, you know, I've seen some of the protests and I've also seen some, uh, I worked as a homeless shelter monitor for a point in time and saw it there and attempted to stop it. And unfortunately could not, um, but, so, and I'd also like to take this time to mention, um, you know, just in the memory of uh, Marcus David Peters, who was a young man, young black man who was shot uh, by the Richmond Police Department. His memory, you know, is something we keep fighting for. 
Now, what I'd like to say uh, by starting off is something relatively provocative, I feel, and it's that I sort of view the police as essentially a third party in a weekly bicameral system. Now, when I say a weekly bicameral system, there's no real opposition party in America. Both the Republicans and the Democrats are married to the continued propagation of capitalism, and that is not something they can challenge, but in the most weak terms. And what I say in relation to that is the police are one of the purest tools of capitalism. While both Republicans and Democrats are united in protecting capital, the police, and I would include our global military in this, act as a cultural gatekeeper, a material one, and a racial one. You know, politicians will die. There will be changes and realignments of voting blocks. There will still that, you know, as of now, there will still be police. For instance, uh, just to kind of go on, the, you know, as the third part, the head of uh, New York's police union called for uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio to resign. And this is one of the most powerful mayors in the country, probably one of the, you know, a mayor of one of the most famous cities in the world and the biggest city in America. Oh, hi, Chris. Chris, you've, uh, there. Yeah, it seems you've it seems you've uh, lost a little bit of connectivity. Um, if you could start over your point, that would be great. Thanks. Are you there, Chris? Um, um, if it if he comes on in a minute. We'll give him the rest of the time. We might have to move on, but let's yeah. just wait a second. He was pretty, he wasn't very far into his opening remarks, so we can just slot him in after the next speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think, yeah, we might do that. We're, we're gonna move on to the next speaker. And with that, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Mike. Sure. Ready? Mm -hmm. To us, the Progressive Labor Party, we see racism as a key necessary component of capitalist society. So if you want to get rid of racism, it basically means that you have to get rid of capitalism, basically. And the Marxist movement, since it first began with Karl Marx in the middle of the 19th century, he saw racism as a very divisive force in society, dividing the working class. And he actually wrote articles and actually sent a letter to Abraham Lincoln supporting the union in the fight against slavery. He helped organize um, dock workers in England and um, textile workers in England to refuse shipments of cotton from the South as a way of supporting the rebellion, the fight against slavery uh, during the American Civil War. So the Marxist movement, the communist movement has a long history in seeing the importance of fighting racism as a tool to maintain capitalism and to divide the working class. And there's two aspects of racism. There's the ideological aspect, i.e. the ideas which justify the special oppression, the super exploitation of people of color. And then there's the actual practices of low wages, poor healthcare, poor education, et cetera, et cetera. So the ideas uh, basically have been uh, developed really initially in the United States. People often think about racism as something that's been around forever. In reality, racism as we know it today began in colonial Virginia in the beginning of the, of the 17th century when African slaves and white indentured servants were brought to the United States, were brought to the colony of Virginia. And what happened in the early part of that century, they began to realize that we're both treated pretty poorly. Let's get together and fight to improve our conditions. Well, there was a, there was a slave named uh, John Punch, and there were a couple of white indentured servants, and they got together and they fought back. And the result was these, the plantation owners said, we got to deal with this. So they basically took Punch and made him a permanent slave. And they basically gave the two white guys, you know, a sort of, well, we're going to add a year to your uh, indentured servitude. And it was downhill from there. All the laws which uh, said, you know, slaves are property, 
slaves, uh, if you're a slave, you're always a slave, your children are slaves, et cetera, et cetera. All those laws were all developed out of colonial Virginia. And then by the middle of the 19th century, we began to develop the ideas that there was some sort of thing about black people in particular, an idea, a set of ideas which justified this treatment. And uh, the initial ideas were like, you know, they had something about their brains which tended them to be lazy and slovenly. Uh, they were liked being enslaved, they liked being imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then of course we came into the 19th century, the 20th century with the whole of genetic ideas. Albert Shockley, who was a Nobel Prize winner and invented the transistor, developed the idea that blacks were genetically inferior. Uh, the was the bell curve theories about, you know, basically black culture. Uh, black uh, brains being somehow inferior. So it's a whole set of ideas to justify this poor treatment. And uh, then of course, there's the actual exploitation. Uh, the capitalists make a tremendous amount of money off the super exploitation of black, black and workers and other people of color. Average wages for blacks are generally significantly lower than they are for white workers. Uh, Blacks historically have not let in to, into the professional jobs in the same proportion as white workers are. Educational expenses on black workers are often, or now in this country, Hispanic workers are always significantly less than uh, they are for the dominant white population. So those practices have generated a tremendous amount of surplus value, tremendous amount of profits for the capitalists. Now, the communist movement we're, we've taken the position, yes, we should reduce uh, police funding, all these sorts of stuff. But the reality is that unless you get rid of capitalism, you're not going to end racism. Because like I said initially, capitalism is one of the main pillars of capitalist society. Now, the communist movement, you know, basically has been engaged in fights against racism, you know, for a long time, and particularly against police brutality. One of the founders of the Progressive Labor Party, Bill Epton, was accused of criminal anarchy in 1964 for his leadership in the Harlem Rebellion when a police officer, uh, her name was Gilligan, uh, killed uh, this young uh, black uh, boy, 15 years old, named James uh, Dowell, and uh, it sparked the Harlem Rebellions. Uh, so that was just you know one of the early examples of fighting back against uh, police brutality. There was also in, in, in the DC area in the 1970s, there was actually a group of Nazis who you know, used to regularly parade around in police-like uniforms in Arlington on the Memorial Bridge uh, promoting racist ideas. In 1978, the Progressive Labor Party and a bunch of our friends went up to their headquarters and beat them all up. Uh, they then left Washington, moved to West Virginia. <laughs> and I guess disappeared after that. So, uh, and there, all these various actions of police murders, uh, we've been involved in many, many of them. Abado Diallo, Elizabeth Bumpers, Trayvon Martin, uh, Michael Brown, we sent a group of people down to St. Louis, Ferguson at the time of his murder uh, to help promote the struggle against racism there. Uh, we've been involved in the American Public Health Association where we've got a resolution passed two years ago declaring that racist policing was a public health issue because of the stress it put on the lives of black and other people of color. So we have a long history of uh, involving ourselves in all this. And in DC again, uh, you know, when Miriam Carey was murdered by the Capitol Police a couple of years ago, we organized activity around that. Uh, those police have never been charged. Uh, Marion Carey was a young woman who made a wrong turn on, uh, on 15th Street and turned into the access road to the White House. Uh, the police came out. She backed up and drove away quickly. They chased her. They got her up to the Capitol grounds. They surrounded her and they shot her, even though the baby was in her child, an infant child was in the back seat of the car. Those police have never been held accountable for that action, basically. So that's just one of the more recent. Uh, Terrence Sterling was riding his motorcycle. The police thought too fast. Third and M Street Northwest, they surrounded him. They killed him, basically. An unarmed uh, black man again. So there's a whole history of this. And we've been involved 
than almost all these struggles uh, throughout the many, many years of doing this stuff. Um, so uh, I just want to sort of summarize by saying if you know if you want to get rid of racism, if you want to get rid of police brutality, if you want to get the disproportionate treatment of people of color, you have to get rid of capitalism. And to get rid of capitalism, you have to actually build an organization of workers, students, professional people that's organized to accomplish that goal. Today, the Black Lives Matter movement, all these other activities around, they're all great, but there's no serious political organization which is pulling them together and moving them in a revolutionary direction. A lot of people feel, well, maybe if we like well, Joe Biden, things will be better. Well, Joe Biden authored the criminal bills in the Clinton administration, which led to a lot of the mass incarceration. We elected Obama, and he actually, you know, we talk a lot about Trump and his policies towards immigrant workers, but if you actually look at the numbers, Obama incarcerated and broke up many more families on an annual basis than Trump did. And on an annual basis, he deported many more people than Trump has done, basically. So, and also many of Trump's, many of uh, Obama's deportations were interior deportations. That there were people who already lived in this country for a number of years. Trump's deportations are more or less catching people at the border and tossing them back across the border. So they're both terrible, but the idea that electing a Democrat as opposed to Trump, somehow things will be significantly different. The rhetoric will change, but the policies of capitalism, maximizing their progress, preparing for war, preaching racism, dividing the working class will continue unabated until we can actually build an organization, a communist organization, as the outlook of destroying capitalism, ending the wage system and destroying racism. You cannot end racism without getting rid of capitalism. You neither can you, you can also even get rid of capitalism, but you cannot get rid of racism unless you also destroy the wage system. Because as long as some people make more, more money than others, there's always gonna be some excuse as why people of color are making less and that's what racism is all about. So without that, and I'll end and I'm open to any questions in the future as we go through this discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. I'm moving on to Chaz. Hi. And uh, yeah, uh, first I'll say that I basically agree with Mike about ending capitalism being necessary to end racism in the US because the divide and conquer tactic has been in play forever here. Uh, and, but uh, going, on, going on from that, one thing I'd say is that I'm extremely happy to see the, the demonstrations against police brutality and racism are going on all over the country and they continue to go on. One, one of the reasons why the anti-war movement back in the 1960s eventually prevailed was because people were out there marching and organizing, especially marching, just making it visible week after week, month after month, year after year. That was extremely important and I see the same thing going on now. Uh, to cite a somewhat uh, less sanguine example, that was the way that the Iranians got rid of the Shah in 1979. Uh, you know, what they came out of was arguably, came out of it with, was arguably worse than the Shah, if that's what, if, uh, it's pretty incredible, but it, uh, you could actually make a good case for it. But both, what both of these things show is the necessity to not just go out of march once and then give up. Uh, hopefully there will be some kind of organize, organi organize, organization, organizations coming out of all of this. And uh, as far as the role of the left in that, I would say it's primarily to try to advance our ideas that racism is tied to capitalism. Uh, that, that I would say is the number one, one thing. And uh, secondarily, to try to make sure that the organizations, any organizations that come out of this are as democratic as possible, horizontally organized, democratic, democratic as possible with no one on top giving people words. Uh, beyond that, getting to uh, some other things. Uh, one thing, uh, 
that, that we need, really need to, to make clear is that uh, the police violence people are reacting to, it's not isolated. It's been going on forever in this country. The only thing that's really changed is that people can see it now because almost everybody has a camera. That's the primary thing that has changed. And we need to make sure that people, that it's, uh, that police violence is up in people's faces so that they see how absolutely awful it is, how dehumanizing. Uh, you do that, it will go a long way to helping to end it. At least it'll outrage people, which is a good thing. Uh, let's see, um, I'm a little bit scattered today, uh, but uh, what, one other thing is that I think that um, uh, as far as ideas to advance in our, you know, in our publications, websites, going to demos with signs, et cetera, is that there's a number of things uh, that really need to happen. Unfortunately, we're not in a revolutionary situation right now. Uh, I wish we were, but we're not. Uh, I, would say, I would say that the demands of the left should probably be, first of all, to end police impunity. The police have essentially a license to commit murder. And they do it, they get away with it, also because they routinely commit perjury. I know a guy down here who the police fr tried to frame. They had no physical evidence. However, they had the evidence of eight cops. The defense attorney managed to cross, he had a good, thank God my friend had a good uh, defense attorney, but he, uh, the defense attorney took apart the testimony of the eight cops and there were so many inconsistencies that he got my buddy off. This was a long time ago. This was back in the 1970s. But uh, this sort of thing still goes on, which brings up the next point. One of the reasons they could get away with trying to do that particular frame job was because no body cameras. I think one of the things people, people have got to demand now is that cops have body cameras on at all times with no ability to turn them off or to delete footage. That's really key. The only reason people are so outraged right now is because they're finally seeing what's been going on. Those of us on the left who have been involved uh, in left politics, demonstrations, et cetera, et cetera, have known this for decades. Uh, most people don't, especially people living in a white suburban bubble. And the only way to really get through to them is to show them what's going on. So I think that's uh, really uh, pretty important. Other things that I would say that should be on the left's agenda is um, demanding, uh, what's it? oh yeah, demanding, you know, such relatively minor liberal things as uh, civilian review boards of police policy. Also, uh, one thing, it's rather than the broken window policies, at least try to get your local authorities to install a community policing model. It's not ideal. We still have cops. They're still upholding capitalism. They're still upholding the status quo. But at least with community policing, they're not so brutal. Uh, and let's see. Another, you know, one other thing that uh, talking about the intersection of, of racism and capitalism and policing is that it's really necessary to talk about prison reform. We're not going, unfortunately, not going to be able to abolish prisons overnight, but talk about getting rid of laws against victimless crimes, ending mass incarceration. And, uh, fi you know, finally, one thing that I will say is uh, to reiterate the first point is that it's important to remain active. Uh, uh, don't let things be one-time things. They should be ongoing. Uh, to, give, to give you one, one example, uh, I was just getting ready to leave San Francisco in 1992 when the Rodney King meeting took place and the subsequent rioting. Uh, most people don't know this, but there was massive rioting in San Francisco too. Uh, I was a part of it, um, not, 
It started out peacefully and then people were gathering in front of the state building downtown on uh, Van Ness and McAllister. And we saw this huge mass, you know, I, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with SF, but Van Ness Avenue, it's like a hundred feet across if you include the sidewalks, huge mass of people coming up from uh, the Excelsior district, um, uh, Mission district, et cetera, et cetera. And they were pissed. Uh, we knew there was going to be violence. So I ran into my pal Keith McHenry with Food Not Bombs. They had this huge Food Not Bombs banner. Well, we, we turned going up Van Ness, started yelling Pacific Heights, Pacific Heights, which uh, is one of the richest neighborhoods in San Francisco. We knew there was going to be violence, so we wanted it to be there. People were going to trash anything, let it be Pacific Heights. Unfortunately, the uh, demonstration turned downtown. There was just massive, va massive vandalism, massive police violence in, re in response. Uh, my pal Keith, the, uh, he was very active in food not bombs and SF at the time. The police targeted him, smashed in his face so badly they had that he had to have reconstructive surgery. He still has uh, neurological and pain issues to, dip to this day because of it. They charged him with assaulting a police officer, being so badly beaten that he had, had to have reconstructive surgery. And they got away with it because there was no video of it. They got, also, one, one final thing there is that with the Rodney King uprisings, they were temporary. They, you know, they were basically one-off events. If people had been marching, had been demonstrating for weeks or months after that, something, so, there might have been some real changes. But as long as people uh, just let it go at once, there wasn't. So I would say right now, the most encouraging thing going on is that people are continuing to get out and demonstrate daily all over the country. It, it, this is hugely encouraging and uh, thank you. Thank you, Chaz. Next, we'll go to John Palmucci. Hi. Um, sorry about that. All right. To get right to the point, we should probably just admit to ourselves that the left has failed to address police brutality in any kind of meaningful way. We acknowledge it, police brutality that is, and rightfully so, violence on behalf of the state against its people is simply just a matter of fact. But we have done and continue to do nothing to really address it, you know. We have, uh, we've got the slogans, abolish the police, defund the police, abolish prisons, abolish this, abolish that. But we rarely explain what that means or how it's possible under capitalism. Uh, typically what we'll say is, well, it isn't. It's not under capitalism. We can only do it under socialism, which is probably true. But then we don't do a very good job of explaining that part either. Um, so while on the surface, we, we have the right rhetorical response, that's kind of it. We, we just have the rhetoric. Uh, if we're trying to build the left, we probably need a lot more than rhetoric. Um, we have some perceived victories too. And I say perceived victories because they're not really victories, of course. Uh, I'm sure we all remember when the Minneapolis City Council uh, said it was going to disband the police department. Wow, that was huge. Uh, that was definitely a victory, right? Uh, turns out they can't really do that. Not really. Uh, not without amending the city charter. And then there's this whole process. And they put, they were going to put um, an amendment on the ballot in November to let the people vote on it. But then the city's charter commission blocked that and deferred it to a later time 
So uh, maybe they'll disband their police department one day and maybe we'll find out what that even means. Probably nothing good, probably just uh, police as we know them under some kind of different name. Uh, but that doesn't matter because a victory is a victory, right? Um, but that's the thing, uh, you know, as things stand, those are the kind of victories we're going to get because those are the kind of victories that they'll let us have. You know, um, uh, some statues came down, uh, you know, I, when we're talking Confederates, like that's a really good thing. Like, sure. Uh, our pancake syrup is changing its branding. Probably also a good thing. Um, the worst team in the NFC East will change its name. They're now the Washington football team. Okay. Great. Um, you know, but our elected officials, most of the time, we're talking Democrats here, uh, they'll gesture towards, towards some kind of progress. Uh, uh, you know, oh, we're going to do something about this. But then we never actually see it. Uh, those are the victories we get to claim, the meaningless ones. Uh, and we're mostly going to accept them, and so that's all we're going to get. Uh, there are those who claim we are on the cusp of a rev excuse me, revolutionary moment. And while that's a nice thought, uh, last time I checked, we don't really have like, like a like a real socialist party, like a real party. So I don't really think so. Uh, like, what's the revolutionary aim here? I mean, yes, we're angry that uh, the police are using excessive force, are killing people, um, oftentimes black, uh, but that that anger is not like a revolutionary aim, it, it's anger. And we're human, we should be angry and we should express that anger. We probably shouldn't confuse it with uh, any kind of socialist revolution because we're a long way from that. You know, lately we've been uh, hearing, uh, you know, the mainstream media, the press, they love to ignore even like the prominent leftists. Let's, you know, Chomsky, uh, Angela Davis, for example, right? Uh, they've been around a long time. Even liberals know who they are. And they generally like to ignore them, except for every four years when they, uh, when they, uh, it, when it's in a presidential election year and they invariably tell us it's time to vote for a Democrat, like both of the two I just named uh, and many others have done um and you know uh they say he'll be more amenable to our pressure that he'll reduce harm for someone somewhere maybe hopefully uh, and the number of socialists that are willing to back biden which seems like most of them <laughs> like uh it's staggering and unsurprising at the same time but you know it it just seems like all roads are leading back to the democrats and you know eventually all this stuff's going to fizzle out and you know what are most of us going to do in November? I mean, I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden. And I would urge anyone who calls himself a socialist in any kind of remotely serious way to not even consider it. But that's the road we're heading on. And then we'll get four to eight or more years of that kind of complacency. And, and then, you know, the guy that's possibly worse than Trump comes along and then it's the same thing and it's, it's like um, I realize I seem kind of sour on all this how we uh, the left seems to orient itself around the issue of police brutality since that's what this panel's about um, 
uh, in truth, it's just kind of more of an overarching disappointment. And I don't think we should be afraid to uh, express that, you know, it's, it's uh, we just keep going on with like optimism and, and you know, like there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of like neophyte leftists that are, you know, that are, are trying to get into this too. And if we just feed them bullshit, frankly, I, I don't know where that's going to get us. Like, it, it's just, it, it's just been very disappointing. And, you know, I hope we change that. I think that's the point, right? Thank you. Thank you, John. Chris, are you back? Can you hear us? Hey, Chris, I see you're unmuted. Can others hear him, Ethan? So, yeah, uh, as far as the technical stuff goes, he was chatting with me and he's ready to go live. Um... Okay. Um, well, whenever you're ready, then I, you can, if you want to start from the beginning, go ahead. If you're able to change your audio to your cell phone um, in the next minute or two, maybe that could help. I don't know. Yeah, we might <clears throat> we might have Chris communicate what's going on to us, and then um, we might. We might move on, have a partial response, and have Chris jump back in if whenever he's ready. Um, what I wanted to start with for some follow-up, everybody's going to get a chance to respond, and we're going to start with Mike. Um, one thing that I'd like to hear about, what seems to be happening in the panel, is that we have two kind of rah-rah, say, members or, or advocates saying that there's activity going on, there's protesting. We need involvement, it's the number one thing. And then we have somebody who's younger but pumping the brakes a little bit saying he has some concerns. So I'm looking forward to hearing if you have any, any ways to address or any insight on what, what John had to say. Um, I mean, I think he's, he's a little bit cynical. Uh, I think if you look at you know the history of like the last hundred years or so, uh, a lot of times uh, there's not much going on for a long period of time. There's activity, there's activity. And then suddenly, uh, almost out of nowhere, there appears to be large scale rebellions. That's certainly what happened during the depression in the 1930s. It's again, what happened in the 1960s. So, you know, but in those uprisings, those periods of instability in capitalism, give you the opportunity to win large numbers of people to begin building an organization which can actually sustain the struggle and move it to a higher level. So the first thing you have to do is really look at why did the movements which developed in the 30s, you know, they lasted until the 50s and then they died out. The movements in the 60s uh, really didn't even last that long. By the 70s, they were pretty much gone. But you have to really sit down and evaluate what happened to those movements. And based on that understanding, maybe we can do a better job this time around building a new revolutionary movement based on the principles of Marxism, building to get rid of capitalism, ending racism, et cetera. And the way I see that happening is essentially, yes, there's a lot of young people out on the streets demonstrating, but a lot of them really aren't thinking of where is our strategic power? Where can we have real leverage against the capitalist class. And you know, in, in, in modern the United States, there's certain industries, transportation, aerospace industry, the hospitals, the medical industries. If some of those groups of workers, transportation or railroads began to say, look, 
we want the police to be defunded. We want the police to be cut back. Then you begin to have real leverage against the capitalists, basically. And basically, if they don't respond, you can up the struggle and intensify it. But the key to doing that is actually having a number of workers and students who are actually committed to the revolutionary process, or are not going to become cynical, or are not going to move off in the wrong direction, who have studied the history of building these movements and have a pretty good idea of what went wrong and how we can be more successful going forward, basically. Great, thank you. Um, is Chris back and ready, or should we keep on moving on? I can, uh, I mean, if anybody can hear me, is anyone yeah, able we to can hear, hear me? You. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. I am yeah, really no sorry. I don't know what's going on. Um, so I'm gonna, so I don't want to ruin the pace too much, but. Um, no, not at all. You should go ahead. Okay, thank you guys so much. And it's been really great to listen to a number of people who are, frankly, more experienced than me. Um, I've only been an organizer for about the beginning of the Trump campaign. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not even 30. So it's, it's good to hear from people who've been doing this for a while. And what I kind of want to start off with um, is something that, that might sound provocative. Um, and, I, and I do also want to say, you know, I would not be here without having witnessed police brutality, uh, having attempted to stop it uh, against certain home, against homeless individuals in the city of Richmond. And, you know, also seeing a protest and also in, here in the memory of a young man named Marcus David Peters who was uh, murdered by the police. Um, and the way that it helps me to kind of think about the police and kind of their place in the world is I think that it, they're essentially almost a third party in a pretty weekly bicameral system. And when I say a weekly bicameral system, what I mean is there is no opposition party. We have the Republicans and we have the Democrats who are both, who are, you know, both so married to a system that only serves a certain number of people in this country, uh, of which they are both members. You know, we have no workers party. The Republicans and Democrats are united in protecting capital. Uh, the police, and I include our global military in this, act as sort of a cultural gatekeeper, a material one, and a racial one. You know, it is easier for us to imagine a society without capitalism in a lot of ways than it is to imagine a society without police. Now, they also act as a material gatekeeper. You know, poor people, if you get pulled over for your brake light being out or you don't your driver's license is expired or anything like that, you know, something you may not be able to afford. And then we cannot speak without they're also recognizing a racial one. The just horrid conditions we put are, you know, black, brown, and all colored citizens and also our queer people of color, all of that. Uh, you know, what happens is, is that, you know, politicians will get out of office, they'll die, voting blocks are going to change, and they're still police. They have essentially married themselves so much to the continued propagation of capital that it's impossible to really, that, well, it's not impossible, but it is very, very difficult. You know, uh, we have police unions that call for the mayor, probably one of, the, one of the most powerful mayors in the country, to resign. We have Joe Arapaio, who breaks laws that, you know, during his brain, that were just, in, just inhumane. There's no better word for it. You know, if you followed anything out in Los Angeles, we have Lee Baca's sheriff's department has literal gangs in their sheriff's department, um, of the, the white supremacist gangs. And he was actually finally sent to jail, I believe it was Lee Baca, for obstructing an investigation. You know, they are, in many ways, they're miniature governments. You know, to go off of Mike's point, um, when he was talking about, you know, transit unions, which I think being able to plug up the streets and stop the flow of goods and all of that is so powerful. But if, a, you know, if a head of a transit union told a powerful mayor, uh, I'd build a Blasio to leave or to resign, you know, it would be chaos. Now, but I do want to point out, though, is I don't think police are a totally independent body. I think, in a way, a lot of ways, they're parasitic. You know, they are a parasite to the host of, essentially, the state, and the host is weak, right? The host, in a lot of ways, is weak right now. You know, we are a country that has such horrid health, state health infrastructure, and people are furious. You know, there is, you look at everything, and you just see our government's response, 
and I feel like there's a lot of anger, and it's it's just anger then, by all means. So we can't disconnect the federal and state government's failure to deal with the coronavirus with the protest, you know. This is a moment that a state has proven itself in a lot of ways to be entirely illegitimate. All it can do is enrich the absolute fewest lives, and everybody else is killed in disproportionate numbers. So when Breonna Taylor and George Floyd get murdered in cold blood, there's a challenge, and we see that in the form of these protests, you know, as Chaz alluded to, you know, buildings get burnt, uh, targets get looted, and frankly, that's good, because in my opinion, you know, those, people look at those as almost symbols, and it's like, this is what basically is upheld, and the world is no longer working for me, so why should I let this stand, you know? I think a corrections office, like in Kenosha, Wisconsin, being burnt, in a lot of ways, is worth a lot of, a lot of treasons. And I'll speak mainly for my organization, because I, because I have some qualms with the Democratic Socialists of America and their response to this. I feel that there's a bit of a voyeuristic look at this, you know. The Sanders campaign, which is, I think we haven't really spoke about, it was imbued with such a messianic power that it could not bring about because it was essentially going to continue that propagation of, of capital in a lot of ways. There were going to be changes, there were going to be reforms, and I would have I would have voted for him, but I also don't want to get it twisted because the president doesn't grant the working class power. The working class has to build its own power in the form of unions and these organizations that we speak about. The president's job is to execute the state's affairs, and the state should be the cumulative representation of the people. But right now, I don't even know if that would have been the case. And to return to what point I made earlier, Bernie could have been elected for one term, two terms, maybe it's an FDR situation where he's elected for four, but there would still be police. A president ha is useful in a lot of ways. I think they set the tone for the country. Uh, for instance, just how much leeway Donald Trump gives to white supremacists. But ultimately, and I speak on my organization when I say this, you know, our capacity was built to pray for this long shot. That still would not have amounted to socialism, which is what I want. I don't know, you know, maybe certain people are there for other things, but I, what I want is, is I want a government that, I want a working class state. I want a government that I, essentially what I want is socialism, or I want communism, whatever word you want to use for it. There's differentiations. So I think those are the lines we're fighting on. And as the left, I think that there's a lot of places, uh, as Chaz referenced, you know, things, these protests in the Rodney King rides, these moments where people are infuriated and they loot, which I'm in favor of looting and all that, they end, uh, they just, they just do, they fizzle out, people get tired, you know, they're, it's an exhausting world we live in. So what I believe the left's job is, is we have to, we have to give places for that anger to continue to flow. And we have to say, you know, I believe there's a Mexican Communist Party flag or a poster that says as long as, you know, it's like, don't let this, don't let this sadden you, let it radicalize you. What we have, what I believe our job is, is that we have to create these organizations that educate these things. We have to have theories of a state. We have to have theories of how the police protect capital. And we have to teach that to people. And we have to learn from people who don't have the same experience as us. We have to learn from people who experience it. You know, knowledge goes forward and knowledge goes back. I don't believe in just sitting there and screaming something into somebody's head until they just take it and just roll with it. You know, there's things we are going to learn from people in this process. And then after there's education and people understand that, there has to be organization to continue to teach and strategize for resistance. You know, legal, extra legal whatever is called for. You know, we have to learn from people who are in the streets because right now the people in the streets, that's our opposition party. That's really, that's what we have, you know? And we have to have some form that continues to allow them to have a place for that anger once protests in. You know, I, I'm admittedly very non-doctrinaire on whether it's a party or if it's a union or anything along those lines. I will admit I lean towards a party, but I think a this is kind of party that Mike alludes to is, you know, quite a bit different than the way the Democrats operate or the Republicans operate. And there has to be an organized front to crush the police and capital. I am to in total agreement that you cannot, they are, there has to be 
the threat of violence to continue to prop, you know, propagate the system that we live in. You know, and there's brilliant work that we have to carry on because we owe it to a lot of our martyrs and the dead and all of this. You know, we have to be there when the protests end. You know, there has to be somebody who, and this is alluding to what John said, there has to be somebody who explains, okay, when we say defund the police, what we're talking about is, is we're talking about a strategy over time that is going to allow us to abolish the police. We're not talking about moving money around in a budget. We're not talking about, you know, just taking that, taking one thing and making it hard for them to exist. I believe where the, the left can really excel right now is we have to educate people on this tradition that I believe we're all part of socialism is this long-standing tradition. Even in America, which we act like it isn't through all of our cultural programming, you know, we have to educate to organize people and we have to organize to educate. So that's a lot of my thoughts on the process and I'll end now. And thank you guys, everybody so much for inviting. Me. No problem, Chris. Um, we're gonna go back into the responses. I'm gonna put Chris last so he can tune in and, and respond. I'm gonna take it over to Chaz. Thanks for those opening remarks, Chris. Um, but Chaz, one thing that I was thinking about is how some people, especially Mike has brought up the, the problem of the party and Chris was talking about an opposition party and I wanted to hear what you make of uh, those political modes or, or the necessity of the political party if you do believe that there is a necessity with all the Your mic's off, Chaz. Okay. Hi, am I back? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, can we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Okay. good. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, okay, well, I don't, uh, I don't agree that uh, a political party is necessary. At best, if you, if you go the party route, what you're going to end up with is some type of social democratic system as in the Scandinavian countries, which admittedly is much better than this almost unbridled capitalism that we've got here, but it's not what anybody really wants. If you really want a socialism, if you want an economy where, uh, you know, from each according to his abilities to each according to his deeds, you're not going to get that way through a political party. Uh, you just have to take a look at the Soviet Union, East Germany, all of the other so-called communist countries, which frankly, uh, I consider state capitalist countries to see that as long as you have organized domination and submission with those on top employing violence to control everybody else, you are not going to end up with anything approaching an egalitarian society. Uh, the second thing I would say about that is that if you take a look at society, what really needs to be organized? It's the economy the production of goods, services, uh, you know, deli uh, delivery of things like health care, uh, the electrical grid, et cetera. That can all be subsumed under the general term, the economy. And there, what we really need is for working people to start to organize to take control of it. And I'm not talking through the present AF about the present AFL-CIO unions, uh, which are frankly an impediment to re revolution. Uh, uh, they tend to be conservative, they're organized top down, they're hierarchical, and they serve, frankly, as buttresses to the status quo. Uh, a good example of that is back in the 60s and uh, early 70s, uh, the Teamsters under Frank Fitzsimmons supported Richard Nixon during the Vietnam War. And uh, so the, the AFL-CIO unions are not the solution. In fact, I think they're an impediment to it. What I would say beyond that is that, uh, well, just sticking to, to examples in this country, uh, the one real revolutionary union movement that you had was the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, which was crushed following the Red Scare, uh, followed World War, uh, actually also during World War I through use of the Sedition Act. But it was crushed uh, uh, during World War I and following World War I. Thousands of people were thrown into jail, sometimes for years, 
And what they advocated was that workers simply take over the economy and abolish the government. And that was, you know, that was anathema to the capitalist class and also, frankly, to Leninists, um, with, their, with their fixation on seizing state power, supposedly in the name of the people. Uh, let's see, going on from that, regarding uh, the Democrats and uh, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders and all that, uh, regarding Sanders, I like the guy. I would have voted for him, not, no question. Uh, the, uh, however, one thing I would say is that his uh, slogan, calling his movement a political revolution, ludicrous, just absolutely ridiculous. There's no way on earth it was, because it was essentially a call for relatively minor reforms. Uh, the work the country would be a better place if they were installed, but it would not have changed the fundamental nature of anything. Uh, also, right now, as far as Joe Biden goes, I, you know, I, I don't like him, you know, because I, which I think it was uh, John who alluded to Biden's role in the uh, uh, mass incarceration with the 1994 crime bill. Uh, I, there's a lot, lot wrong with the guy. The one thing I would say is that the good news about Biden is that he is, he is a shameless opportunist. He will go whichever way the wind is blowing. And if he gets in, and if we could put enough pressure on him, we're gonna see some reforms. How far they will go, who knows? But uh, as far as voting for him, well, as Howard Zinn once said, it takes five minutes, so why not? And uh, yeah, that's about all I've got right now. Great, um, thank you, Chaz. Bringing it to John, uh, I know that your your remarks were prepared beforehand, and one of the panelists said that you know there's a bit of a cynical character to it. Has your mind changed based off of any of the points that these other panelists have said, or do you have anything to respond to with respect to your disposition? you know, the way that you wrote uh, the message that you had to share? No, not really. I mean, I, I just heard that it takes five minutes to vote for Biden, so why not? I mean, he's given us, what, almost 50 years of reasons why anyone who considers themselves a socialist, communist, anarchist, you know, anything that isn't a Democrat, you know, uh, He's given us all these reasons to not vote for him. And to me, that's the easiest thing. I, I actually made a joke about a, a few months back with, about a, a mail-in balloting, because here in New Jersey, like you could do that anyway. I know that's like a big topic now, but I said, I'm in support of mail-in balloting, uh, mail-in voting, because it makes it even easier for me to not vote for Joe Biden. Like if we can't, if we can't even say that we aren't going to vote for Joe Biden, how are we going to organize any kind of revolutionary anything? We can't even bring ourselves to not vote for Joe Biden. Like, it's like, of course I'm cynical. I mean, yeah, I haven't been in this long, about five years, right? Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's because I, I, like, yeah, I'm a socialist. I'm joining the Socialist Party. And I love the Socialist Party. Don't get me wrong. But, but looking at, like, the left as this larger thing, it's like, okay, yeah, we can harken back on the 30s and the 60s. And where did that get us to? Where we are right now, which is where? We're talking about voting for Joe Biden. So it's, I, I mean, <laughs> I can't help but be cynical. I mean, I'm 35 years old and, you know, God willing, uh, I at least have another 35 years, maybe, you know, I mean, but like, no, I mean, I, I you know, I, I wish I didn't feel this way, but I don't think it's my fault that I feel this way. I didn't choose to feel this way. You know, if, if I feel this way after only half a decade of, of uh, participation with the left, then, you know, I mean, I just, I'm the kind of person who just, uh, 
you know, like kind of takes things as they are and thinks about them and, you know, oh, so this is how it really is. Uh, you know, yeah, I was into Bernie a few years ago and, and now I'm not like, cause, you know, I don't know. We just, <laughs> we need more than that. And uh, uh, sure. I, I see my own role or, uh, rather like lack of, uh, achieving anything too, but I've only been at this for a few years, you know, uh, basically it's like if we had those moments in the thirties, well, we didn't seize on them. If we had those moments in the sixties, we clearly didn't seize on them, seize on them, seize upon them because here we are now in 2020 and, and the best the left has to hope for is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris maybe possibly doing some reforms. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. I, I, the, the last administration, uh, uh, Biden was involved with, you know, when he was vice president, they appointed Republicans to the national labor relations board. Like, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I mean, and and I'll tell you what else. Like I'm in a trans transit worker union. I'm a train conductor. Uh, I try, I I try, you know, but but radicalizing the rest of the union, which in my local is almost 1,200 people. Oh, all I can say is I try, and I usually get a like red baiting kind of comments in return and that doesn't deter me you know and i don't i take it all in stride but like believe me nothing i say or feel is uh out of lack of trying i didn't i didn't come to socialism or the left already thinking this you know that's that's what's happened to me over the last few years if you caught me five years ago i would have been all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed about the possibilities but I just, you know, I mean, I mean, we're going to be voting for Biden. I'm not. I'm wearing a Howie Hawkins pin. I'll, I'll vote for him. At least he's some kind of a socialist. Like that's, I feel like that's the least I could do. If it takes me five minutes, the least I could do is vote for socialism. It doesn't mean anything because we're not going to get socialism from that vote, but we're not getting that vote from Biden. We're not getting socialism from Biden either. So I'm going to vote for the socialist. Thank you, John. Um, I know that Chris mentioned the weak bicameral system. I'm wondering if, um, if I even need to prepare a question, I bet you have a, a lot to say or a lot to relate to what these panelists have told you. About the uh, weak bicameral system. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I very much, I, <laughs> you know, it's it kind of, it's kind of hard to say. I guess ultimately, what kind of helps me is that, in a lot of ways, and this is going to sound very self-help, but. I don't mean it to sound self-help is that ultimately I feel like voting is, it's just, it's one thing. It's not the, I think that electoral politics, I mean, we've seen, a, we've seen attempts to, you know, an entryism and these things and um, by these kind of social democratic or liberal parties. And they tend, you know, a lot of times they tend to get crushed. You know, I can't fault people for lack of, for trying. When I say a political party, I or a party, and again, like I mentioned during my remarks, I'm pretty non doctrinaire on this. It essentially it's a formation. It is a place. Maybe it doesn't run candidates, maybe it doesn't. I that, that to me, I have in a lot of ways stepped away from focusing so much on the electoral thing because I will 100 percent agree. I hate Joe Biden more than I enjoy breathing. I despise everything that man has ever stood for. I despise the fact that his followers smeared to mayor uh, terror, excuse me, as Russian opposition or whatever the hell they were saying. I despise that man with every bit of 
vim and vigor that I have, I, I don't know if I'm going to vote for him. I'll be 100% honest. I, I might go in and I'm, I, who, who the hell knows what I'll do? I'm still undecided, frankly. I am, uh, maybe CNN can talk to me as one of the undecided voters in this country. I don't know. But to me, what I've kind of done is there's a little bit of the, what's the, the AA prayer where it says, uh, things I can change and things I can. And what I know I, you know, what I can do is I can continue to be in these organizations and I can continue to push people towards the realization that the system as upheld, we essentially have, I believe Chomsky's called in the past a business model or that it exists to continue the propagation of business. Uh, you know, it's, it's just which, you know, do you want, I mean, do you, during Pride Month, do you want rainbow colored Doritos or do you want, or do you want somebody who's going to bark at the fact that, you know, queer people are people? I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of the choice you're given. And I think that we, as far as a revolutionary moment goes, I, it's hard to say, you know, that there's some sort of scientific moment where it's like, that's it. That's the one. There's so many things. I think, you know, and I think one thing is that there is a sort of weak chauvinism with a lot of uh, U.S. leftists in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying that of anybody here, but I see people who see things that are almost commonplace in these other countries, you know. And it's like, this is the one. This is where it's going to go. And it's just, you know, there's the more you read about history and the more you think about these things, you kind of should slowly come to the realization that, you know, we're ultimately not that special. There's, there's a lot of American exceptionalism we need to breed out of that. Um, that's, I think, the reason, I, and I will admit, one of the reasons I focus so much on education is ultimately that's what I want to do, is I want to be a high school teacher. But I think that when people begin learning their history and they begin learning, okay, well, uh, like Mike, so interestingly alluded to, I was not aware of the um, any sort of moment where in, believe, um, indentured servitude and slaves ever joined together. That's something I never knew about until I was on this panel, and I'm fascinated by that, and it's something that you can continue. We have to have those moments. We continue to get people, so you begin pushing them towards the realization that in order for there to be any sort of just, equitable system, that can't exist under that. That just simply cannot. There has to be in capitalism, there has to be a boss who tells you what to do, who holds total impunity over your life, who can, if you're sick for a week, he can say, well, he's not showing up to work. We got a no call, no show, and then just kick your ass out. The things that we want just cannot, are just so abrogate to the system that we currently pop, the, that we live in, the water we swim in every day, that like I've said, we have to teach people, you know, ways to resist. We have to teach people where they go. We have to give people places where they can, there has to be mutual, these mutual aid networks set up. I mean, my life has probably been saved by leftists, like God knows how many times. You know, it, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit here, but I feel like the more people get in, con, get in touch and they learn these things and they read radical literature, whatever stripe, but again, I'm fairly non doctrinaire you begin coming to the conclusion that, okay, well, the Republicans and the Democrats, the, the, they get their money from continuing to propagate capitalism. If they walk away from that, that they're nothing. They would rather, it's the iron law of institutions, they would rather rule over the ruins than they would have any world that is slightly better and give anybody an inch. So, um, now I'm kind of fired up, so, but... That's sort of my take on the my campaign. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, we're going to move it over to the Q&A part now. And um, we've got four questions right now. The first one's from Danny Jacobs. Looks like it's to all of the panelists. And um, I'll deliver it in order and give everybody maybe two to three minutes to respond, maybe longer if we start to get some kind of dialogue or something interesting. For the benefit of the recording, Gabby, if you can read the whole question, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first question from Danny Jacobs. If one preaches racism today, they will be fired from work, banned from social media, ostracized, etc. This seems to fit capitalism quite well. It is a regulation of the labor market. The divide and conquer tactic 
used to rely on racism to divide the working class, but now the working class appears to be divided on whether something is offensive or not, rather than claiming some right to racial, racially superiority versus equality. Is the fight against racism really tied to the fight against capitalism anymore? And we'll start with Mike. I would say definitely the fight against racism is tied to the fight against capitalism. Right now, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, racist, racists are a little bit on the defensive, basically, at least in the ideas they're able to put forward. But the capitalists themselves have not retreated from racism. Schools that serve Black neighborhoods are still underfunded. The wage differential between Black and white workers are still in place. The poor health care and poor insurance for Black workers and people of color are still in place. So the material conditions which create the basis for racism have not been alleviated at all. And that's what needs to change, basically. And that's where the struggle is. Yes, you can't say racist things right now, but the real issue is, can we change some of the conditions of life that people of color live under in this country, basically? Just, I mean, what, two days ago in Wisconsin, another unarmed black warfare was shot and uh, paralyzed. So, uh, that certainly didn't, I mean, the whole movement has certainly not stopped the practice of racism either by the police or by the capitalists. It's changed the rhetoric a little bit, but the material conditions of life for people of color have not changed. Thanks, Mike. Um, now, Chaz, is the fight against racism really tied to the fight against capitalism anymore? In the US, yes, uh, worldwide, in most places, yes. However, you can take a look at certain places like, you know, just off the top of my head, Iceland or Norway, almost 100% white, still capitalist countries. There are still the problems inherent to capitalism in those countries. Having said that, I would say that racism is inextricably tied to capitalism in the US. Uh, there's no question of that. And, and you can't really address the problem of racism and police brutality until you address the uh, problem of sy systemic racism. Things like redlining, the number of police, uh, number of people killed by police. Uh, black folks, it's two and a half times as many per capita killed by police as white people. Uh, the number for Hispanics is also similarly high. Uh, so race is tied to both the police uh, police brutality and the capitalism. You know, the, going a, a bit further on about capitalism, uh, as uh, some of the other panelists have said, it's been used as a divide and conquer tactic in this country forever. And so I don't think that you can address the problem of racism and, and police brutality without also addressing the role that racism plays in capitalism. Thank you, Chaz. Now to John. If you'd like it reread to you, or you no, can no, no, no. I, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, the uh, I think yes, it, actually, it still is because um, if we look at the way the working class tends to be divided in uh, the present day, it's usually around. Uh, it pretty much predominantly around issues of identity, uh, oftentimes race. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's some kind of accident, um, that, you know, that, like the, that the Democrats, the, that whole, uh, you know, and even Republicans for that matter, that, that they traffic in that kind of stuff, um. So if we're if the working class is divided and and one of the ways we're divided is on uh, you know on racial grounds, then I would think that yes, yeah, so addressing that would help us in uh, the quote unquote fight against capitalism because. We have capitalism, and this is what it's doing to the working class, is 
is we're divided on all this stuff. And, you know, like, yes, different people, different colors experience different things. Um, and some worse than others. There's no escaping that. But, uh, and there's no denying it either. But uh, that's definitely what the capitalists want. And that's what they're getting. And that's what we're buying into. So yeah, I, I think, I definitely think the two are definitely still linked because, you know, he, we can't really address one without the, uh, we can't address the capitalism thing until <laughs> we, uh, we address the, the racism aspect. And now we have, uh, you know, Democrats mostly telling us what racism even is. You know, I, if you watched any of the DNC, it's all about systemic racism this, systemic that. <laughs> when they're the ones, <laughs> it's their system. So, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I definitely think it's the two are still connected. You know, maybe we have to change the way we think about how they're connected, but it's definitely still connected. Thank you, John. And then last but not least, Chris, is the fight still tied together against racism and capitalism? As long as every person in this country lives under capitalism, then yes. I don't think there's even really much, much to add. Um, I, there has been a, a bit of an odd a thing that I, I don't understand. I don't, it's this tendency that is just, it's in a cemetery. I just don't get what, I don't get it. Where there's this idea that when we say working class and Frankly, I think the media is hoarded for this. Um, I, I'm from the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, I grew up in Wise County, Granddad, and Coal Miner, all this. Where when they say working class, they mean a guy who, you know, they mean a coal miner. They mean a guy who's uh, got, you know, got, he's got a hole on his face, got a chimney sweep almost. And a lot of that comes down to a weak understanding of what the working class is. And the working class is essentially anyone who has to sell their labor to live. Uh, there are divisions, there are things in there that, you know, we can make a about all day, but that's what it is. We live under a system, and it is it touches every color, and if you are in a situation where you are born into intergenerational poverty, and you are born into, um, and you were born into these, you know, these, you know, these neighborhoods that are under and all that, that's not accidental. That is designed for a reason. A lot of that comes down to race. Um, and if you're poor, you have to sell your labor. I mean, there's just no way around it. You know, you don't own other people's labor. You know, you want a boss, you want a manager, you're, you're a laborer. And as long as that's the case. Now, we can talk, you know, about individual behavior. We can talk about people, your uncle saying things that aren't good. I mean, anyway, you know, and I've fought family members on this and said, yeah, well, maybe look at it this way. Maybe look at it that way. People are, people are ultimately pretty contradictory. Um, you know, people will, people will think that the guy that they work, well, you know, somebody who doesn't have anything to do with them, uh, because they pay taxes, they're funding their, I mean, in a lot of ways they are, but if you were not in the same situation, would you not want that? You know, there has been, the right has done a job in this country of making the idea of welfare or creating any sort of social good just disgusting to people. And it's it's just a huge travesty. And as long as we live under a capitalist system where people are selling their wages, and I may come up to me, a black guy from Southwest Virginia, and he can say, okay, you get $10, but a guy, you know, an inner city guy gets eight then that's still the fight. That's still very much capital. And however they come up with that, you know, we can go into sociology and all that. However they come up with that formula is one way, you know, I think we can be spin all day. But as long as that's the case, then yeah, it is absolutely 100% tied to capital. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, it looks like we have some more questions and we're running up against some time limitations. We don't want this to get too much longer than two hours. So um, I'm gonna recommend that the panelists respond a little bit more succinct. I think it, it could be easier even though it's tempting. We put a lot on the table and I'm impressed so far. The second question is, 
Uh, for John in particular, it's about something that he mentioned, and it's from Danny Jacobs. The question is, John mentioned the problem with slogans like abolish the police at the moment. Is the ambiguity about how this would be done or just straight avoidance of any explanation of how one would get there? Chaz also mentioned that this couldn't happen overnight. So how do we get to abolishing the police? What is, the ne what is necessary to do and what is inhibiting or blocking the necessary preconditions to achieving this apparently popular goal? I'll start with you, John, since it mentioned you first. Yeah, I think we should probably stop with the maximalist stuff because we're in no position to really, I mean, once we're talking like a uh, maximum program, well, hopefully we have the strength uh, then the numbers to just implement it. Uh, so I, I do think it's, it, it, it's maybe we, uh, why can't we formulate some like minimal demands and those minimal demands can't be like Democratic Party nonsense, which is probably the best we're going to get. But, uh, you know, like, why can't we come up with like a vibrant list of like minimal demands and be like, hey, you know what, the socialists got behind this and they organized around this and they actually did achieve this and that would and, and maybe that's like like a real victory instead of all the kind of like hollow victories i referenced in my opening remarks uh i think we start there and it's yeah it, it's not gonna happen overnight and admit that to ourselves but do something about it instead of you know it's yeah abolish this and abolish that and defund this all sounds great you know that's why they're slogans i guess but they're not we're not going to get that people are going to be disappointed they're going to crawl back to the democratic party anyway so why not come up with some kind of like real meaningful demands first and and that at least gets us on the path i mean maybe that's not what people want to hear but i that's that's my answer to that. <laughs> um, how about you, Chaz? Do you have, do you have anything to add to the comment that this can't happen overnight? Yeah, unfortunately, it can. I wish it could, but it's not. It's not going to. Uh, right right now, what we could focus on are trying to get some specific reforms out of the Black Lives Matter movement. And you know the general uprising against racism and oppression in this country, and uh, you know, I would say focus on practical things, such as body cameras on at all times with the cops being unable to turn them off. Uh, also, ending police uh, immunity for you know police get a, routinely get away with murder in this country. Uh, uh, jumping around a bit talking about uh, voting for Biden being somehow an obstacle to achieving socialism. I don't see it. I don't see it as an either or uh, possible, either or situation. Because uh, I quoted Howard Zinn earlier when he said, why not vote, it takes five minutes. And he went on to say that continue doing what you're doing, continue organizing, continue doing any type of political work that you're already doing. Don't pour your energy down the rat hole of electoral politics, but it does make a difference in people's day-to-day -day lives, whether you have an absolute uh, psych psychotic monster such as Trump in office, or if you have somebody who could be pressured to uh, deliver at least minimal reforms. Also, uh, one other, couple of other things I would add about that is that if Biden is elected, there, there likely will be some movement on climate change problems. If Trump is reelected, it's going to get a hell of a lot worse. Uh, so there's there's that, and uh, it's not an either either or situation. And uh, that's about all I have to add right now. Okay. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on to a remark that Sushi and Scott Nair put in. Surely, making small changes in the right direction is better than just going in the wrong direction. 
And I'm going to open that up to whoever feels like that comment has to do with what they said. Whoever speaks first has it. Okay. First of all, I believe, I believe. Oh, did we, we can have two. It's okay. Yeah. I, I do not believe it's anything wrong with making small changes, basically. Like, for example, about the police, just getting a policeman arrested and thrown in jail because it's something that he's done, like killing a black worker or beating up somebody. I think that's an accomplishment. I think that's the type of activity that we should engage in, basically, is trying to, you know, accomplish small things like that. So there's nothing wrong with small victories. But the question is the context in which they're done. If you think a fault, small victory is electing Joe Biden, no, I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden because that's pointing people in the wrong direction. I'm not going to lobby for legislation which supposedly will control the police because I've seen what's happened with that legislation. Plus it doesn't work. But I am going to a demonstration which demands we get this policeman arrested and keep it up until he gets thrown in jail, basically. So I've seen, and I've seen that work occasionally. But the bottom line of all this stuff is unless you build an organization which has the outlook of getting rid of capitalism, none of these things are sustainable. They come and go. You make some laws, you get a guy thrown in jail, a few years later he gets out or he gets pardoned by the president. Like who did uh, Trump just recently pardon basically. You have to build an organization, a revolutionary organization that's based in the working class, which educates people and leads them down the road of revolutionary change. It's not gonna happen overnight like uh, Chaz said, but if we don't start building it now, it will never happen. I also wanna say one thing also about the Soviet Union. You know, the, so the revolution in the Soviet Union was made by 15,000 people. That was its weakness. There weren't that many people wanted to communism or socialism. They wanted bread, land, and peace. So that led to the continuation of the wage system, a lot of differences between richer and poorer people, and eventually restored capitalism. We should learn from that. Let's build a political base for communism even before we make the revolution. Make sure our party is based on the idea of equality and ending sexism, ending racism. I think we can then sustain the actual building of a class of society if we do that. End of story. <laughs>you're muted. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mike. I'm going to move on to the next question and give everybody a short chance to respond to it. It's from Emilio Fogarty. And it says there seems to be some agreement that we are not in a revolutionary moment because of some obstacle or the lack of a direction or party. But doesn't this imply that these past couple of months should have been a revolutionary moment that we did experience, an inflection point in history that we failed to grasp? What then is the obstacle we're faced with that explains why we cannot make these moments of discontent in history matter? And I'll have Chris start. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, Amelia, that's a hell of a question. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, for me, I don't see, there's been so many moments in American history, or there's so many moments that can, I think you could say would be, you know, these moments could be revolutionary. Um, we can have our disagreements. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you get five answers from four people about Occupy Wall Street. Um, but that was a moment in which the systemic, essentially what caused the crash was recognized. We knew we had the perpetrators, we had them red-handed. They were considered to be too big to fail or anything like that, but there were there was a moment. You know, I I don't believe we've sorry to interrupt, Chris. Are you referring to like Occupy and Wall Street, like a 2008, or are you talking about the present moment? There was a moment. I I am admittedly kind of trying to I was talking about Occupy Wall Street. I feel like there's been so many moments that you could have said, okay, that's the moment it could have changed or anything like that. I, I will say that I don't necessarily think it is a socialist, anarchist, communist organization job to predict history in a lot of ways. I think the job is, is to be ready when the, when the, you know, when the capital state is so ready to fail, that's when you take action. Um, you know, when in Soviet Russia, or not Soviet Russia, in Tsarist Russia, when we saw essentially 
people just sent to just die for a war that made ultimately, I mean, that people, frankly, always forget about now. You know, um, I know there were soldiers in World War One that would bob like sheep as they walked to the as they walked the front line because it was just so absurd. It was why are we doing this? You know, our job is to be great. I I think that in we can push towards it and we can change it. Um, we have to be ready for moments like this. To say whether, you know, this was a revolutionary moment that failed or this is a moment that we screwed up because we didn't do this or that, the time has passed. I'm personally, you know, I like to think of myself as materialist. So, you know, in a lot of ways, so the material that I have in front of me right now is that, okay, well, we didn't get socialism out of the George Floyd uprising. So we have to be ready for the next time there is an uprising, is the way I look at it. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mike, so why, why can't we make these moments of discontent into history matter? Well, first of all, I, I think this is the beginning of a revolutionary movement, but a, a revolutionary moment, but it's, so it's the opportunity to build an organization which can transform the moment into an actual revolution. This morning, I, got a, I met with 40 people from Spain, who I'd never even heard of until about a month ago, who sent me a note, I want to talk to you about making revolution. And what are you guys for? And we had a, uh, it was a uh, crowdcast discussion about it. So, I mean, and in DC, I've talked to many people who, you know, have been sort of on the fence for a long time about becoming more politically active. You know, to our party, the Progressive Labor Party, all across the country and around the world, we're seeing people step forward and say, look, it, I've heard what you've been saying for the last 50 years. Well, you know, some haven't been along that long, but, you know, I know something is different. And I know we need to begin to build an organization. So I'm willing to step forward and help do that. So to the extent that we can accomplish that in this period and grow our revolutionary movement, then as, as the crisis matures, and it's going to mature basically because China is growing as an imperialist power, its military is growing, its economic power in the world is growing. And at some point over the next 10, 15, 20 years, there's going to be a clash. And that's going to literally kill tens of millions of people basically. And like World War I and World War II, they both created revolutionary opportunities. The Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and unfortunately, the next World War, next world war you know, unfortunately, there is going to be another World War. And hopefully for us, that'll be an opportunity to transform society. But like Chris said, we've got to be ready. I and mean, we've got to build an organization now that can take advantage of that revolutionary situation. That's some serious news, Mike. Thank you. Um, Chaz, what's the obstacle? A number of obstacles. One is that if you take a look at the people involved in the current, uh, the numbers of people involved in the current wave of demonstrations, it's a tiny fraction of a percent of the people in this country. It's not that large a percentage of the people. A uh, more serious obstacle, and uh, I hate to agree with Mike, but I will, which is that uh, the uh, left in this country is so disorganized. It's an absolute tragedy. Uh, where I differ with Mike is that I think it has to be, uh, any type of movement needs to be uh, decentralized, horizontally organized. And uh, since Chris brought up Occupy Wall Street, that's a good example. Because you had a movement that began in one place in New York City and it spread all across the country. There was no formal uh, leadership, but there were dozens upon dozens of encampments. And importantly, people were staying, they were doing it day after day. This frightened the crap out of the government and probably the capitalist class too. So the government incidentally in most places controlled by Democrats and nationally by Obama and Biden crushed the Occupy movement in a coordinated series of police raids. This was a, uh, a textbook example of free political speech, free assembly, and they could not abide it. If it had gone on, it could have led to a genuinely revolutionary movement. Right now, we don't know what's going to happen. I, I would hope that there would be a number of movements come out of this. And the, you know, as long as they're uh, organized 
on the principles of decentralization, uh, non-hierarchical organization, uh, horizontal organization, alter, alter the good. Uh, so uh, to, put it, to put it in more general terms, as long as the organizations that come out of this, and I hope that there will be some ones that last, reject the principles of domination and submission enforced at the point of a gun, which is essentially what government is. If we get those type of organizations that reject uh, domination, submission, and the use of systemic violence, I think we might go somewhere. Mute it again. Sorry. My controls are kind of freaking out, but we, we have somebody live now who wants to ask a question to the panelists. So go ahead, Aaron. Okay, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, absolutely. Great. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, so one thing that struck me about the uh, responses after the opening statements was that it immediately sort of became this discussion about whether or not to vote for Biden. And I think that's telling in a sense because um, the last few months have basically been us watching as the left is upstaged um, by both the Democrats and Republicans in terms of uh, organizing or siphoning up discontents with police brutality. Um, and I think the question of police brutality poses the question of political demands. Um, for leftists in the working class that they do not only have economic demands, um, but in fact that they have political demands and they make demands of the state. Um, and that the question of race that seems to go along with this is uh, really a question of how you organize people, right? That in the absence of an organized working class movement for socialism, uh, there isn't any sense of a shared interest between uh, white and black workers. Um, and that BLM kind of expresses that. So the question I wanna ask is, uh, what is necessary for the working class to be able to intervene in politics? Um, I think this has kind of been discussed with the very most recent comments about organization. Um, and just uh, to add to that just a bit, um, Chaz, you mentioned earlier that the most organized the working class in America ever was, was the IWW. And I was just wondering what you thought was lost um, when the IWW kind of, as it dissolved in the 20th century. Thanks. Okay, sure. Uh, I, first of all, um, I would say, I did not say that it was the most organized that the working class has ever been in the US. I, I would say, say that probably goes to the CIO of the 1930s. Uh, however, what was lost with the crushing of the IWW was the concept of a, of a, a union that focused purely on seizing the means of production and continuing them under workers' control. Uh, none of the current uh, unions that exist, none of the political parties here in the U.S. are advocating that. And so uh, as for what the for what was lost, I would say advocacy of direct democracy on the shop floor, for lack of a better term. Uh, I think it's extremely important. I wish more people were talking about it. Any um, other responses to Aaron's question about demands? I can, um, I'd like to say a thing or two. I mean, I think that Aaron makes a fantastic point is that in a lot of ways, this did, there was a fair bit of this that came down to the question of vote for Biden or no. I think it's in a lot of ways because we've lost the ability to talk about vision and we thought lost the way to talk about anything beyond, you know, these kind of piecemeal reforms. We've lost, we've lost an ability to have a vision for society that is, that works for everybody. We have, we just simply, and you know, IWW is a great example and something I personally am not thought I'd draw a fair bit from not exactly as an anarchist or even anarchist, but it's something I'm definitely inspired by. And the pure idea that Chaz refers to, you know, that shop floor democracy, it is a shame that we don't talk about that. And it's a shame that it, the conversation instead goes to this, I mean, this just, this, this frankly monster, this just 
empty husk. It, we, in a lot of ways, we've lost the vision. And right now, I think so much of the work is about rebuilding that vision, you know, into that society where we can talk about those things. It, it, is, a bit, it is a bit depressing, but, you know, a lot of people have referred to the Howards in, you know, it takes five minutes, why not? I don't know, I've got, I'm 28, you know, we'll see how things pan out. I got the rest of my life, so why not, you know, stay around to help give an idea of that vision of what that might be you know that's it is a bit sad um i think i probably took this in a little bit of a direction that Aaron may not have expected but i hope in some way that i do agree with you no i think that i personally think that voting is unless you're voting actively for a white supremacist like donald trump i i'm very much kind of i shrug at the idea I, people want to do it, that's fine. If people don't want to do it, that's fine. I do wish that radical organizations had, you know, that do want to run or they want to talk about these things. I wish they had more of an idea of what they're, what they're getting into because I do think a lot of people kind of have these very broad-eyed and bushy-tailed ideas. And I wish that – I think it, I think that actually does when we talk about vision. Um, a lot of these great speeches that we've seen by radicals, um, you know, Fred Hampton's speech uh, where he talks about, you know, the mountain and all that. We, um, you know, that kind of rhetoric in a lot of ways, I feel has been lost. And when that is lost, we get this very bold, this world we live in that is both just crushing and boring. And, it, you know, it's not the worst thing about. That's just the thing I think we all feel. We feel kind of bored. We feel amiss. I these organizations, whatever they may be, and I said I'm pretty non doctrinaire and I'm going to stick, stick to that point, whether it's food dogs, whether it's the Progressive Labor Party, whether it's, you know, there has to be something that says, okay, we are going to go beyond what we are currently in. We're going to go forward. And there has to be something more than that. You know, and whatever shape it may be, God, I, I hope that God will around long enough to see what it might be. That's kind of mine. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit in the questions because there's one about Trump, which you brought up, Chris. I'm going to give it to all the panelists to give a short response, even though that might be difficult. Uh, the question is from Andoni Melitho Melithopoulos. Do you think that reducing funding to the police is impossible within capitalism? What do you make of Trump's claims that economic growth is the path towards criminal justice reform? And I, I'll start with you, Mike. I mean, first of all, some money that's spent on the police can be transferred to other things. I mean, police have a lot of functions which really aren't necessary, like giving out parking tickets, dealing with mental health crises and things like that. There's other social services that could be provided by forces other than the police. So police budgets actually can be reduced. Other, also, the militarization of the police has become excessive. They don't need these, you know, AR-15 you know, some of these cars are driving around in which look more like war vehicles, basically. So I think, you know, there can, those type of things can happen. But I wanted to, I wanted to say a thing about what Aaron, I guess, said. You know, I, I believe, like, in our union, right now we're, we're raising two fights. One is that the disciplinary policies that the authority has used have been extremely racist for a number of years. So the Black Lives Matter movement has given us the opportunity to address, we want to change some of these rules, which have led to a lot of Black workers not being hired because of back, criminal backgrounds or because of excessive disciplinary for relatively minor violations. And at the same time, we're also raising economic issues because the crisis is causing Metro's pension system to have major trouble. And they're figuring ways, how can we reduce those benefits to a predominantly black workforce? So I think, you know, uh, that's what I also wanna say about the IWW. You know, the reason why the IWW collapsed because people like William Z. Foster, Bill Haywood, uh, Tom Mooney realized that you need to do more than just seize a factory because the government has state power. They call out a police force and they drag you out. So William Z. Foster and those people, they all left the IWW and joined the Communist Party basically because they thought that was a more useful vehicle for building class struggle in this country. And voting, there's a nice article in the Brookings Institute which just came out today about why protesting is just as valuable as voting. 
I mean, that's a fairly mainstream uh, institution, basically liberal Democrats. So they realize that protesting all these marches does have an effect on the political climate in the country, and we should take advantage of it. Um, I don't want to prolong this, but I'm, I don't know if you answered the second question. Or do you have a, do you just not believe the, the claim that Trump is making that economic growth is the path towards criminal justice reform and that's pure opportunism? Or is there no rationality, no possibility of that being true? I mean, basically, there's been economic growth in this country since the 1970s. And corresponding to that economic growth has been mass incarceration. So just simply economic growth uh, does not, there's no correlation there, basically. I mean, there's more jobs, there's a different job, there's more technology, there's more labor productivity, but a racist criminal justice system is still in place. All right. Um, John, what do you make of these claims about economic growth and criminal justice reform under capitalism? Yeah, I'm kind of with uh, Mike on the the second part of that with uh, Trump's claims that economic growth is the path towards criminal justice reform because we've had a lot of economic growth over the years. Where the hell is the criminal justice reform? Uh, so, um, you know, that's kind of where I stand on that as far as uh, do I think reducing funding to the police is is impossible within capitalism? No, of course not. Of course we can reduce uh, police funding. But I mean, I was, I said in my, as I said in my opening remarks, like it's basically just like an empty slogan that doesn't really mean anything. So yeah, it's possible. Uh, what that means, I don't know. I, a lot of things are possible under capitalism and until we get them, <laughs> we're not gonna know what they are. But they probably won't be any good. All right. Um, I think there, there's actually a question here where everybody would get between two and three minutes to make a response. And, it, and I think it concerns everybody who's been talking. It's, it's from uh, Kevin Dong, and he asks, to all the panelists, uh, isn't everything you all call for completely possible and doable within bourgeois politics? How is socialism, Marxism, et cetera, necessary to adequately address the issue of police brutality. And I will start with Chaz. Well, if you really want to end police brutality, you've got to end the police. Uh, and you're not going to do that under capitalism. You're not going to do that under any governmental system. Uh, it can be reduced, but not eliminated. Uh, and the you know, the relatively minimalistic calls for things like ending police immunity, police review boards, uh, uh, let's see, what, what else? Uh, civil, civilian control boards, uh, body, uh, body cameras on at all times. Those are achievable. Under capitalism, yes, they're achievable. However, you're not going to get rid of the police as long as capitalism exists. It's just not going to happen because essentially they're providing paid muscle, paid by the taxpayers for the capitalist class. That's their basic function. And uh, uh, so th they're going to continue until capitalism is gone. And frankly, until a uh, hierarchical government, which is essentially institutionalized violence is gone. Uh, until you get rid of the state and you get rid of capitalism, the cops are going to be there. All right, um, Chris, what do you have to say to uh, this question? I um, actually, unfortunately, I am trying to find a charger for my phone because uh, I'm in the middle of a move. So unfortunately, I'll have to pass and delegate this to somebody else. Sure. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Say the question again real quick. So isn't everything you all call for completely possible and doable within bourgeois politics? How is socialism, Marxism, et cetera, necessary to adequately address the issue of police brutality? Okay, well, first of all, the things that I've advocated are not possible under capitalism. Capitalism is based on the concept of commodity production. Workers sell their labor power to the capitalists. They create value through that labor power. 
and that allows the capitalists to accumulate tremendous amounts of wealth while the workers stay relatively poor or put a, you know, something that they can subsist on basically. So now you need to have a justification for doing that. And you know, that justification is racism, sexism, et cetera, et cetera. And then you also have to have a mechanism by which you can maintain those inequalities. And that's what the role of the police is. So if you want an egalitarian society where people work based upon their ability and their commitment and receive things back based upon their need, I and mean, there is no exploitation of labor, no sexism or no racism, you can't have capitalism. So, I mean, that's the bottom line. These, the things we're asking for, abolishing the wage system, ending racism and sexism are necessary for the preservation of capitalism. If you wanna get rid of them, you have to get rid of capitalism. And finally, John. I'm not entirely sure what I've been calling for, uh, but uh, I mean, are some of the things that uh, socialists, anarchists, what have you, uh, call for possible under capitalism? Yes, uh, and uh, it's still not happening under capitalism. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess that would be my defense to that, even though I, I don't, feel like I, I've really uh, called for anything. I've more so just said, like, we're not really doing or achieving anything. So, um, but yeah, so I guess that's my answer to that one. Okay. And then Chris, I know your phone's low on battery, but actually, if you do have one, do you have any more time to come on the air for just a second? Because there is a quick question for you. And I think it would help. It was a question that came up for me and somebody asked it. Are you there? No, nah. I am here. Yeah, oh, okay. I managed to yeah. I tracked so, down a charger. Um, oh, great. Thank, thanks, everybody for putting up with me. I'm sure this has been a sh shambolic uh, experience for all. But um, <laughs> So what the, I'd say is, oh, actually, do you mind if I change the question? Because it's one that's uh, specifically for you. And it's one that came to mind to me as well. Uh, absolutely. Sure. absolutely. So we have Diaz Mathis asking for Chris, could you say more about why you think looting is good? Who is it good for? Well, so I, I said that I did kind of brush that off. When I say looting is good, what I'm referring to is the idea that I think that it is, a, I think it's a valid form of protest. I think that if you work, you know, I think when the target in Minneapolis was burnt down, there were, a, whether this was known or whether this was not known, there, it came to everybody's attention that the target in Minneapolis had actually, during one protest or another, had turned protesters away. You know, community resentment builds, and I think that when you get to the point that you make these situations, you know, you make or make you these businesses, you make them almost like signs, you know, of your current order. When people see that, you know, whether or not it's the most productive thing, we can debate that all day. When I call looting good, what I'm referring to is I think it, I think it does in maybe some small way. I think it does slow down the productive gears of society. I think that that. To, for me to, you know, him and haw and for me to go, okay, well, uh, well, maybe, you know, it's like you want change, but could you slow down on the looting or anything like that? It feels very, it feels very parochial to me. And I, I think it is just as much a valid form of protest as, say, uh, you know, any other form of protest that we have. You know, I would... I would not tell anybody to go out and loot, but I think that when a situation happens and when people look at what they've got going on in their city and they, they have no claim to anything, they don't own, the, they're alienated from their labor, they don't own the mean, their means of production, then what, it's kind of like, what the hell do you think was, you know, things are going to get burnt down. Um, we've also, you know, we've referred to it lightly, but, you know, when the Kenosha Office, Office of Corrections got burnt down, I didn't really shed a tear or I didn't really feel like it was setting the movement back. It was like, okay, well, it got burnt down. That happens. I think that we should remember as kind of our own, you know, our own lineage, the thing that we all in a lot of ways come from is the French Revolution. It started with the storming of a prison. That's not specifically legal. That's not specifically 
that's not specifically something that you're gonna get you know not thrown in jail for but it's where it started so looting for me is as valid a form of protest as a vote as anything and i just it would not sit right to me for me to say otherwise so that's my take i whether you find that convincing whether you don't that's up to you but that's what i meant when i said it great thanks chris um i think we're we're on our probably our last question and this one's going to be for chaz it's a it's a comment towards chaz from andoni it says i'm surprised by chaz's ambivalence to biden i would have thought an anarchist would be steadfast in their insistence on organizing civil social action against the state. I wonder if this is because he is pessimistic of the ability to organize at this level or something else. What I, what I would say about that is it's not an either or proposition. As I mentioned earlier, voting for holding your nose and voting for Biden will help in certain respects. There's an old leftist trope that the worse things get, the better they are for revolution. I don't buy it. Most revolutions have taken place in times of rising expectations. If Trump gets in, the boot is going to come down even harder than it has already. Uh, expectation, uh, he'll crush the Black Lives Matter movement, and there will be less space for people on the left to operate. So I, you know, I would say, yeah, continue to organize, continue to do all, you know, all the social movements, uh, anything else that you think is useful. But don't think that that's inconsistent with voting for a mild liberal who will not be as bad as what's currently in office. Great. Um Great. Unless anybody has a final, I know actually Mike was, I saw him gesture a little bit or there was something he found to be not totally true or, you know, disagreed with what Chaz said. Do you want a moment, Mike? I mean, I just think it creates illusions when you think that uh, you should vote in these elections, basically. It creates the illusion that somehow things will get better. I think it's only through class struggle that things get better, basically. And uh, that's what we have to constantly organize, use our energy to accomplish, basically. And I, you know, just one last thing. I mean, I think everyone here should join the Progressive Labor Party, help us build a revolutionary movement and bring down capitalism, basically. And within that movement, we can work out some of our differences. But as long as we're all going off in 37 different directions, we're never gonna solve these problems of capitalism. I'm saying never at least in my lifetime anyway, and probably in Chaz's. <laughs> all right, well, I think that, think that we've all done a great job. Uh, congratulations to all of our panelists, and thank you so much for being with us tonight on this Saturday. Um, thanks for everybody tuning in and everybody who helped make this possible. Uh, we're going to have, I think in about 15 minutes, we'll drop a link for a breakout session um, oh, I'm getting one question from someone. Just a second. Oh, yeah, you don't have to worry about the. I was just sending mm -hmm. you. Some. All right, yeah. So we've got we've got a Zoom link for a post panel party discussion. You know, <laughs> so join us. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you can if you want. <laughs> I I unfortunately am still in the process of moving, so. I will probably have to sit that out, but um. yeah. Good luck, Chris. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for struggling through this with us. It was uh, it was <laughs> nice to have you on. It really was. I'm glad for, with like what you brought to the conversation. So thanks. Thank you, and I'm really happy to hear from everybody else too. And uh, bless everybody, and everybody have a good night. All right. Good night. <laughs>